go. She's always the one to do the loud whistle thing. Welcome everyone. My name is Tony Everhart. I'm the executive director of Urban Engine, and I'm just so glad that all of you are here. Give it up, give a, a big warm welcome to everybody here for coming out in the heat. <laughs> It's hot in Alabama again. Who thought it was going to happen? <laughs> um, so I'm just so glad all of you are here. It's one of those things where um, we reached out to Glenn and we asked him, would you spend some time with us and share your founding story? We think a lot of people will benefit from hearing it. And uh, he agreed, which was really awesome. And then a lot of people showed up because they were going to benefit from hearing his founding story. So I just am so appreciative to everyone who is here tonight and carved out the time um, to listen and to learn and to hang out and get to know one another. Um, I'm going to jump right into it here because most of you already know me, but if you don't and you don't know Urban Engine, we propel ideas forward. What we talk about here is the importance of community, the importance of idea sharing, collaboration, education, entrepreneurship, startups, technology, all that fun stuff, all that stuff that makes you go, hell yeah, I want to do that. I'm going to get up tomorrow and I'm going to do that. Hell yeah. That's right. <laughs> Thanks, man. Um, so that's Urban Engine. We have co-working night here every single Wednesday night. We do our speaker series events once a month. And then we have anywhere between two to four other events that go on throughout the course of the month, including hackathons and all that fun stuff. You guys don't want to hear from me. What you're going to love to see is people walking in with more beer here behind us. Um, so um, there is beer here. This event is free. Uh, Urban Engine is a nonprofit organization, and if you want to do something to say thank you, you could buy one of these really nice shirts that David is modeling here. David is our application developer of Open Huntsville, and he looks really great in his shirt that you can buy for $25. Um, there's a big tall guy named LJ. Uh, he can help you. Yep, right there. There's LJ. Hey, <laughs> he can hook you up. We're Ahmed at the front. Um, Okay, so I'm going to introduce you all now to Trey Sharp. He is CEO of Tango Tango and Sharp Communications, and then of course Glenn Clayton, the founder and CEO of Appleton and now Spur Jobs. That's enough from me. Welcome these guys, please. Good deal. Uh, well, for any of you guys who have maybe not been to one of these before, uh, kind of give you a breakdown of sort of the order of events here. We're going to spend maybe 30, 40 minutes um, asking some kind of structured questions of Glenn and interview here. And really excited about his answers. Um, and then at the end of that, we're going to have kind of an open audience Q&A. So any of you guys who have a burning question as you go along, I'm sure I am going to not cover many bases so help me out here and think of if there's a question in your mind it's probably in a lot of other people's minds too so hold on to those questions ask them at the end um, so super excited to have glenn here you know we we have a speaker series every month as tony said we've had folks from amanda howard with amanda howard real estate we've had tashia malacasas uh very successful entrepreneur in, in the food business we've had matt mcclellan i've seen matt around here somewhere brandon cruz but I know many of you have an interest in tech startups and, and that sort of vibe. And, and that's what many of you are, are hoping to build or be a part of. So super excited to have somebody from that space, specifically here tonight, Glenn. Glenn, to get started, uh, could you just maybe walk us through what did your early life look like? How did you come to found Appleton Learning? Yeah, thanks. I, I appreciate you having me here and uh, appreciate everybody coming out. Um, yeah, so, so I got started, um, a lot of people uh, in Huntsville still know, hear the name Appleton and think tutoring company, and that's what we got started as. And so um, when I was in college at UAH, um, I was on scholarship and broke, as most college students are. Um, and my scholarship had this provision that I not have a real job which is great because I'm supposed to focus on school, but it did not pay for textbooks. And so I had to figure out a way to, to buy textbooks. So um, I was kind of entrepreneur by necessity, not by design. Um, and so I figured um, I'd done tutoring in, in high school and thought that uh, that would not
be a real job. So I, I got a bunch of friends together and, and started basically playing Tudor Pimp, and <laughs> that was that was how it started. And, and what what time frame was this? What year was this? This would have been in 05, 2005. 05, Okay, so. Uh, so you kind of, you, and, and Amanda actually had a similar story last month of uh, she and her husband were kind of stuck in her parents' house and her husband was dying to get out and she just figured I got to start doing something to make money. So she started doing real estate to, uh, to, to get the heck out into their own house. So, you know, it kind of makes me think of what a uh, Shark Tank uh, guy, Damon John, calls the power of broke, right? You know, it's a, a powerful motivator to get out and create something. Uh, so, okay, you start, you start in 05. At, at what point did this kind of start to become a real thing? I know at some point you ended up raising money and, and kind of went into a franchise model and things like that. Uh, but, you know, at what point did this go from like, hey, this is just something to pay for my textbooks to like, hey, this could be like a real career. This could be a, a, a monster business. Well, I was uh, not, not great as an entrepreneur to start with. Like, I did not understand unit economics at all. And, um, like my initial pricing model, basically every hour of tutoring I sold, I think I lost 30 cents or something like that. So it initially was not a viable uh, business plan. Um, but uh, very quickly kind of learned from my mistakes and, and tried to solve those problems. And I guess about two years in, um, it had gotten to the point where you know, we weren't, weren't making a, a whole lot of money, but I felt like, hey, this is something that I think I could grow and I was enjoying that. Um, experience of being an entrepreneur and solving problems and um, being faced with challenges that I could overcome and really knowing that that kind of my success or failure was was really dependent on how much effort I wanted to put into it and so you know initially I had not planned to, to, to become a, a, an entrepreneur or found a business that wasn't my goal initially um, but after doing it for a couple of years and failing quite a bit along the way um, I said you know I think this is something I enjoy, I enjoy and I want to give it a go and so um, I went to my college counselor at the time and said, you know, I'm working like 60, 70 hours a week and I'm going to school full time and I can't drop low full, full time or I'll lose my scholarship. I'm not really making a lot of money, but I think there's something here and I really want to pursue it. She gave me some great advice. She said, um, if this fails, you can always get loans or whatever and come back to school. But if you don't do this, you never want to look back and say, what if? And so, um, you know, Jeff Bezos talked about his regret minimization approach to, to things, and so <clears throat> I think in a way that was Bernice Rush, my, my college counselor's way of saying that, like, don't do something you'll regret. So if you would regret not dropping out of school and pursuing this business, then you need to go do that. And so that's what I did. So I, I dropped out, I gave up my scholarship, and really started focusing on the business full time about 2007, 2008. So from those, you know, we have a ton of folks here that are early stage in businesses or hope to be early stage in, in an idea or a business. Um, any particular, uh, you know, you mentioned unit, unit economics, any, any particular lessons or anything you took from those very early days? Uh, as you know, because I think a lot of folks, it's like, hey, I, you know, I kind of like tutoring. I think this is the way I can make money or I, I like building apps or I like plumbing or whatever, right? And, and then all of a sudden you find yourself in the midst of, yeah. running a business not just doing a thing yeah I think you know one of the mistakes that I made and that I think a lot of people make um, when they start a business is you start a business based on what you like to do or what you know how to do and that's not really the right way to start a business it, the, the, I think the um, the first step is to find a need that you think you can fill and so you know, find a need fill a need is sort of the, the old saying and, um, so you have to start with a defined need, and that need has to intersect your capability. And so if you find those two things, then that's an opportunity for you to, to maybe do something. And for me, I started as, hey, I know how to tutor, I'll go do that. I need to make some money, so I'll go do that. And then over time, as our business has matured and, and, and changed, and I've had, I guess, the luxury of stepping back and saying, you know, what do I want to do? Like, what are, the, what, what are the skills that I have? And what are the needs that I see in the world that I think I could solve? Um, so rather than start with, you know, what do I know how to do? I think you have to start with, like, what are the problems out there that other people have that my skill set uniquely equips me to solve? And that's, that's uh, fantastic advice. I heard uh, 
Derek Sivers say much the same thing in an interview not long ago. Of, you know, hey, I don't know how to just come up with an idea, but I know how to find problems people need solved, right? Um, so, you know, I, I know we have a ton of people in the audience that are interested uh, in fundraising, pretty much everybody in startup land uh, at least is sort of interested in it because it's kind of a, uh, until you get involved in it, it feels sort of like a secret society sort of thing. You know, it's not something people run into in daily life, you know, it involves money, which is a sensitive topic for a lot of people. So, um, I know you came to raise money for Appleton and you kind of were taking off to do a franchise model or something, you can expand on what that is, but can you tell us what what led you to um, fundraise and, and just, you know, tell us the story of, of that process, right? And, sure. and then kind of as you went through it, um, what you found. Yeah, so um, when I dropped out of school and started focusing on, on the business full time, we quickly grew pretty aggressively. We never really raised any money. Um, it was all organics, it was all bootstrap. What kind of revenue were you guys doing at, at that point? Um, so at that point, we would have been probably around a million dollars, and then by 2010, 11, we would have been around five million dollars uh, in revenue. And so in 2010, I had, you know, we hadn't raised any money at this point, it was all bootstrapped, and we had built technology. What, what Appleton really was is, in the tutoring days, was we had built technology to help college kids who wanted to earn extra money find kids who needed tutoring that they could be a fit for. Um, and so it was sort of, a, before like marketplaces were cool business models, it was sort of that, um, in that we were trying to connect kids who needed a tutor with college kids who needed to make extra money. And that was sort of the, the, the technology that we had built. And we had grown and, and you know, I'm sitting there, we're doing like you know, five million bucks in, in business, I'm thinking, man, I'm so smart. <laughs> and um, so then some people come to me and say, hey, like, we want to franchise this. Like, we want to take whatever you're doing and, and do that somewhere else. And this was the start of me realizing I wasn't that smart and getting a real dose of humility. Um, so I thought, yeah, this sounds great. Like, you want to pay me for me to tell you what I did and you should go do it somewhere else? Like, I'm in. Let's, let's do that. Um, but again, like, I didn't. It wasn't by design. It was by sort of someone coming to me and saying, hey, let's do this. And, so there was a lot of a lot of infrastructure we had to put in place in order to to do that. And so um, we raised about a million dollars in friends and family money. Um, several of those friends are, are here tonight. Did you have somebody in particular kind of help you through that process? I mean, it's always kind of a yeah, not, process not, people just haven't gone through. Don't know yeah, how not, it works. You know, you don't learn really. in school, right? Yeah, not, not really. I mean, you know, I had a, a good attorney that that sort of put together the legal documents. Um, and I had a couple of mentors that had been involved with me for a couple of years. And so between that mentor group and friends of mine personally, uh, we were able to, to put that round together. And the purpose of those funds was to take this business that we had built and set it up to go be franchised. Um, and so we hired a bunch of people and we um, you know, set out on this journey to franchise. We were very, very successful at selling franchises and horrible at, at actually operating franchises. And so we were um, a, a terrible franchisor in the sense of, you know, tutoring wasn't really where the puck was going. This was 2011, 12. So like you had Khan Academy, you had YouTube, you had a lot more online free resources coming available. And so the traditional tutor model was becoming a little less, even though the industry was growing, it wasn't, you kind of see the writing on the wall. Um, and we had not done, a, I had not done a great job at surrounding myself with people who understood the franchise world in a way that I didn't, um, so that they could help me sort of avoid some of those pitfalls. And so we made some of the classic mistakes, you know, finding people who could afford to buy a franchise but weren't really going to be that daily operator in a business. Um, so ultimately, around 2012, we we're realizing that, you know, this franchise business model that, you know, I thought, man, I'm going to be so smart. Um, was not working, and that you know, in 2012, 13, it kind of become clear that you know we've got to do something different, or this thing isn't going to work. And so, so tell us about your mindset at that point, because I mean, I, I think folks who maybe haven't raised money, you don't realize what an obligation you feel as a founder to folks who invest in you and your idea and all those sorts of things, and uh, um, you know, something you can't carry around with you. So. Where's your mind at at that point, and, and, and how does that process evolve? Obviously, you came out of it and were even more successful after, but tell us a little about that, that moment there. 
Yeah, no, it was a it was a defining moment in, in my life. I mean, yeah, I think you you learn a lot about yourself and, and you know who you are as a person when you go through really hard times. Like the, the good times are easy to, to, to feel good about, and um, it's a lot harder to figure out how to do the right thing when things are going bad. And so, but I couldn't live with the idea of you know losing all my friends and family's money, and so that was kind of a, 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 you know, a difficult concept for me and so um, you know at, at that point I felt this huge sense of responsibility of I need to make this work and so again it was like a familiar sort of theme for me it was not starting out the normal way of oh, here's a here's a cool problem I want to solve it was more a here's a problem I can't afford to fail like I can't afford to fail at this and so I need to I need to figure this out and so that's where Appleton really changed and pivoted and uh, moved from being um, sort of technology-enabled tutoring to technology-enabled staffing for um, the school uh, public education market. So, so how did you figure out that opportunity, you know, that you had this technology built around tutoring that could really be applied in a much broader way, right? Or kind of arbitrage to a different market where it was a bigger market, there was more opportunity. How, how, did, you, how did you break that down and figure that out? Uh, dumb luck again. Um, <laughs> so this is a time period when uh, Dr. Wardinsky, the, the former superintendent, had just gotten here and was sort of looking for um, some ways to, to change things a little bit. And um, so uh, he had heard about what we were doing and reached out to me and said, you know, we've typically used staffing agencies to provide all of the support staff that work in our district, teachers' aides. This would be traditional, like Snelling or something like that. Those type of. That's right. And you know, I didn't realize. I never, as most people don't. I didn't realize that there was this whole ecosystem of of labor that goes into a school. You know, most most of us don't think about a school as a large employer, but in most communities, they're one of the largest employers in that community, if not the largest. And Huntsville's no different in that regard. And about half of the workforce that works in the school are not teachers. So it's everything from people working in the cafeteria to teachers' aides to physical therapists to nurses to secretaries and accountants and all these other people that, that make that large operation run. And so schools typically relied on uh, traditional staffing agencies to fill that need. And Dr. Wardensky felt like some of the paraprofessional sort of teacher aid, education oriented positions but not um, not the teacher themselves but those folks that, that still had sort of an educational component that they needed some something more qualitative than what they were getting and um, he actually saw that what we were doing in the tutoring space could really translate well because our core competencies had not were not really around education as much as they were labor management the logistics that went into that so our core competency was you know, around scheduling, figuring out like who's available at this specific time on a very short notice to do this type of job, who has the credentials to do this. And, um, so that skill set that we had developed translated really well into their needs where, you know, on any given day they may have 200 different people out, teachers or teacher's aides or whatever, and they need people to cover for it and they need to have certain credentials to do that. And, um, so they came to us about that. And, we didn't know anything about staffing, so we're like, yeah, we can do that. You know, <laughs> kind of looking at the financial statements, we're like, sure, yeah, we'll figure that out. Um, and so that's how we, how we originally got started. And that was really the first time that I think the, the paradigm shifted for us. And we had found a need that intersected with our core competencies. And so um, from that point in 2013, you know, we went and grew the company um, again with no capital um, at that point. We didn't raise any additional capital uh, to fund that. We're able to, to grow that to you know, what will exceed $50 million in revenue this year. Um, and so that's, I think, sort of the, the power of realizing there's a real need and that you have a real skill set that can satisfy that. It's incredible that just finding that right place didn't just take you like 10% better or 20% better. You went from 5 million to 50 million, right? Yeah. Uh, so that's 10, I mean, that's, that's an incredible difference. Um, so for, you know, folks here who maybe are in a business now, they're working on some kind of idea or solution, um, 
and maybe it's just not quite clicking, it's not taking off, you're not seeing that exponential growth. Are there any kind of, you know, flags or triggers that you would maybe recommend to look for to, and maybe, maybe it comes back to this, find a need that intersects with your capabilities, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but what kind of advice would you give those folks that are in the same situation you were in five years ago? Yeah, I think you have to be um, really humble and acknowledging that, you know, you may not always be right. And, you know, I'm, when I talk with people about our business, I'm pretty upfront about the fact that, you know, we made a lot of mistakes and a lot of bad assumptions along the way. But as long as you're comfortable and confident enough to acknowledge those head on and say, this isn't working. And even today in our business, I mean, you know, a couple of people from our office are here tonight, tonight and they, they know we had like a, a heated debate this morning about a, a, a very sort of in the weeds sort of aspect of our, of our business. But that's good, like that is a healthy dynamic and culture to have in a business is one where you, uh, you know, aggressively seek out the truth, whatever it may be, whether or not it matches up with what you originally assumed was gonna be the case or not. Um, and so I think that served us really, really well. It's just seeking out the truth, whether or not it conforms with our preconceived notions of it. And, and that matches up with uh, good advice from so many uh, I was listening to an interview with Ray Dalio, the uh, hedge fund manager this morning, I was talking about that, so he calls it an idea meritocracy, where it's about the truth and who's got, and what the best idea is, not who it came from or anything like that. We're actually doing a book study on his book, Principles, really? yeah, okay. right now, and, and sort of implementing a lot of those, those practices. It's awesome, it's awesome. Uh, so, you know, we've, we've kind of got caught up in, in the course of things here to you know, where Appleton is today. Tell us about your new venture, Spur, and what you do in Spur, and, and, and how that fits into what you've done so far. Yeah, so if you look over the last few years at what we did, like we were a bunch of kids who didn't know anything about the staffing business, who got into the staffing business, and built technology to help, you know, enable our ability to uh, deliver that, that service more effectively. And what we saw is that we were really successful in reducing the operating costs associated with that industry. And you know, staffing is not the sexiest business in the world, right? I mean, it's not what people think of as like a really cool business, but um, it's a very big problem, a big industry. Um, it's the, the market in the U.S. is 150 billion annually for, for staffing, but m the vast majority of that business is still very much a manually, it, I equate it to kind of like uh, the travel industry before Expedia or Travelocity came along, right? I mean, it's still very much a manually driven business, and most staffing companies, 75% of their SG&A is people, people that are answering the phones and large call centers that are trying to call people and schedule them to work jobs, and it's very, very um, sort of old school processes. And so we built technology to sort of automate the scheduling processes and dis dispatching people and matching up who's qualified to do this job. And that had been really successful for us. And obviously, led, you know, we had a lot of growth over the last few years, um, but we were also, you know, our unit economics were the best in the industry. Um, you know, our, our profitability you know, per labor hour was better than, than other people's. But you know, we had also had this um, you know, difficult realization that the industry we were a part of um, was not necessarily an industry that we were really excited about because um, in the staffing industry, the people that work, you know, if your friend comes along and says, hey, I'm working for a temp agency, you go, man, that sucks. I'm really sorry to hear that. You know? um, and you know, we saw that like the world was changing, the way people wanted to work was lending itself more and more towards this sort of gig economy idea of this portfolio of jobs and People don't want the nine to five anymore, and they want more variety. And the staffing industry was so primed to be a real catalyst for that movement and how people wanted to work. And but it was so focused and entrenched in thinking about workers as disposable resources rather than assets. And um, so we wanted to change that. And we said, you know, we know a lot about the staffing industry now. <clears throat> we know a lot about building technology to help enable that business model. And we think there's an opportunity to kind of take it to its logical conclusion and you know, build that Expedia-type platform for staffing that's a true 
digital staffing platform really bring uh, a full level of automation to that process, dramatically change the unit economics and drive down the cost of providing that service. And by doing that, not only offer customers a better price, but be able to afford to invest more in the employees that worked on our platform in the form of better training, better benefits. You know, temporary workers getting benefits is like, this is not a thing. And we're like, why not? Like, why is that not a, why can't a temporary worker have health insurance too? And why can't we invest in training programs to help people come in at one level and double their income in two years by getting certified or um, credential to do higher caliber work. And so um, the key to doing that though was to build a platform that allowed us to lower lower the operating costs of really automating the staffing business. And so that's what Spur was really designed to do. So we, we built that uh, within Appleton. So we built Spur as a, as a, a sort of subsidiary within Appleton, we used a lot of the profits that we were generating to, to self-fund that, that process. Um, and uh, focused on the hospitality sector, so like catering and event industry um, was a really low-hanging fruit target for us to sort of validate product market fit. And why did you guys pick that, that market sector? Well, there's just really high volatility of demand, so like if you run a catering company, you may need 20 people on Saturday and you don't need anybody for a week after that. So what we were doing really sort of filled that, that need very, very well. And that provided a really easy way for us to test and validate some concepts without impacting our existing business, right? We didn't, we didn't want to disrupt our own business until we knew that the disruption would work. Um, and so we built Spur and so we tested that with the hospitality industry and got a lot of really positive validation. Learned a lot, but got a lot of positive validation of that concept. And so actually this year, uh, we're in the process, and this is, I think, maybe the first time we publicly talked about it, so, um, but we're in the process of merging Appleton and Spur into one company, and so taking all of the education staffing that we do and bringing that onto the Spur platform and making our own staffing company the first staffing company that we disrupt um, with Spur. So, so you've kind of become fully automated. Uh, maybe long-term not be an industry-specific staffing platform. Yeah, that's, that's right. Gotcha. Um, that's uh, that's just really so. So, how for for somebody here who's maybe not familiar with Spur, what does you know sort of a day in the life look like of a person and a business owner using the Spur app? How does that work? And then how does that work for you know a worker? Like, like give us an example of an example business. You mentioned catering earlier, or maybe a bar or something like that. You know, how how does it work for just the average person who would? Um, Maybe, maybe not understand all, all the high-level strategic stuff, but just, you know, yeah. how does it work on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, so what we're trying to do is kind of come up beside the staffing industry as it sits today and provide a much better experience. So let's say you run a catering company and, you know, every weekend you need 20 or 30 people to come work events for you. The way that process would work today is either you have a, a cell phone full of people's numbers and you text people and try to coordinate people to come work, or you call a staffing company, literally call and talk to them on the phone and say, hey, I need 20 or 30 people. You probably call two or three different staffing companies because none of them can you know, reliably predict how many people they have available at any given moment to fill that job. So you call a couple of different ones and see who can fill the jobs first. Um, then people show up, they sign in on a sign-in sheet. Um, they sign out on a sign-out on the same sheet. Um, that is then sent back to the staffing company. They pay those people you know, a week or two later and you get an invoice in the mail. And so what we're doing is saying, we think we can do that better. Like we think we can make that experience a lot less manual. So you go on our app, you go on, you say, I need 30 people. Here's what I need them to do. Here are the qualifications I need them to have. We then uh, immediately notify everyone in the system who's available and matches the qualifications um, through push notification. Um, people can then accept that job or not, so the worker's kind of in charge of that uh, process. That we're not dictating to them that they have to work, but if we, the, the concept is if we have enough people on the network that there are 30 people out there that would want to take that at any given time. So they take that job, they show up, they clock in on their phone, they clock out on their phone, it's all sort of geo, uh, location-based um, authentication. And, um, 
then we charge your credit card and we pay the worker the next day. And so, you know, for the business, it's a really seamless process for them. It's not manual at all. There's no paper to keep up with. It's more like going on and just booking something. Like, it's sort of bringing the staffing industry into where everything else is in, in the 21st century. And, um, and for the worker, it's a much better experience for them too because they have total control, um, transparency uh, into that process, um, and they're getting paid a lot faster, which is important for them. So, so what does your rollout plan look like for Spur? Where are you operating now, and what, what does kind of the near-term future look like? Yeah, so our, our go-to-market strategy is, is really to um, focus on education. As an industry, we understand and know uh, for you know, the, the first half of this year. Um, so we're on a growth trajectory right now where, you know, if with some of the uh, additional functionality that Spur is bringing to us, um, and with you know the, the sort of need that we're filling in the marketplace, um, you know if things continue and investors continue to think fondly of us, then um, hopefully next year we'll be at about 100 million dollars in revenue in the education sector, which would make us a, a market leader in that space. And what that allows us to do is then start to build a commercial, small, medium-sized business um, customer base around that education base. So. In a marketplace business model, whether it's, so what we're doing is, is what you would consider a marketplace platform. You've got two different sides of a market exchanging. Um, Uber is a great example, right? It's sort of the one that we all can really wrap our minds around. Well, Uber doesn't work unless you have enough drivers to match the demand and enough riders to keep the drivers engaged and interested, right? So it's sort of the chicken and egg problem or, or you know, market liquidity if you want to get more technical. That's the really hard problem. We're not the only guys trying to build digital staffing platforms, but no one has been able to achieve market liquidity or solve that chicken and egg problem. How do I get enough workers to join this platform and enough businesses to join it to keep those people busy? Like, who do I get first? Like, how do I solve that problem? Because the workers aren't gonna come if there are no jobs and the businesses aren't gonna come if there are no workers. And so we think education presents a unique opportunity for us to go into a market um, into a metro market, partner with the local school district in that market, which is one of the largest employers in the city and has a, a large variety of different types of jobs they need done, and immediately have market liquidity. So if we partner with the Nashville Public Schools, we immediately have enough jobs to keep a substantial workforce of probably six, 700 people busy a couple days a week. So as a side job, that's good enough to keep them interested. And then we can start going to local, small, and medium-sized businesses in Nashville and saying, hey, we have six, 700 workers who are working on our platform every week. Do you want to start tapping into that supply? And so we think that's a strategy that will allow us to overcome what has, to this point, been the biggest challenge that's kept this industry from, from really taking off. Um, so, you know, now you're very much in the big leagues, right? And, and I know you've told me that... Uh, I don't know about that. <laughs> Now, the media you've leagues. You've told me that you're, uh, you know, in another uh, fundraising round. You've been doing some fundraising uh, and dealing with much different type of investors than friends and family, uh, you know, more institutional type of investors in Silicon Valley or wherever. Um, you know, can you can you give me and a hundred of your closest friends here kind of a peek behind the curtain of that process as much as you can, given that it's an ongoing process. Uh, but uh, again, I think we have a lot of folks here that are interested in that. So. Uh, can you kind of tell us any about what that process is like and, and, and how it's how very different it is from you know angel investors and all that? Yeah, well, you know, when you're raising money from friends and family, they tend to like you a little bit more, and so it's um, it's a little bit of an easier process. You know, what, what I was really surprised about the most so over the last year, I've been traveling a tremendous amount, meeting with investors, um, even prior to when we had like a formal. We just recently actually formally started a fundraising process. Um, but you know, it's good to kind of make those relationships early and, and start talking to investors as early as you can so you can anticipate the questions they're going to ask you when you actually start asking them for money. Um, and that was a really interesting opportunity. So in the last year, I mean, I met four billionaires, um, which was a first for me, right? And so you're meeting with like these really high net worth individuals who've done really amazing things met with venture capital firms, you know, in Silicon Valley, like the, the name brand guys, and 
growth equity funds. And, um, and so I think what was most surprising to me is how like dumb smart money is. I think it's like maybe, I don't mean that in a derogatory way, but a lot of times I think as a founder, you anticipate the you know, venture capitalist or whatever to come in and like be this incredibly intelligent person who's gonna have all the answers to all your problems. And that's not at all what they are. Um, and in fact, I would say I've been underwhelmed with how good like investors are from a strategy standpoint. So it's really important, like I, I talk to people sometimes and they think they're gonna bring an investor on and that investor is gonna solve all the problems in their business. And that is not the way it works. So like you can't, you can't go into that with that anticipation. What they are really good at is, is doing their due diligence and vetting how well you've thought about the problem. So they may not have the answer for you, but they're really good at determining if you've done your research and your homework. And so um, you, know, you need to have all your spreadsheets in order and you need to have everything documented. And um, you know, if, if you're a tech company, you need to have your, you know, your entire stack documented and know, you know maybe you've had some code reviews done. And, um, all, everything has to be documented and you have to be um, you know, ready for that due diligence. But that's what they're really good at. And that's how, I mean, that's their business is to determine, do you know your business or not? Um, and that's been a really informative process for us. It's been a lot of fun. It's challenged us to kind of make sure we, we have thought about all the problems the right way. And in fact, the process of talking to capital has, um, I would say, has been very additive to our strategic plan in, in the sense of we may meet with somebody and say, well, what are you going to do about this problem? And we go, oh, we hadn't thought about that. That's a, good, that's a good point. And so then we go back and we, we look at that. It's a lot better to get that hard question from them than face it in the market, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, so a couple more questions here, and then, and then we kind of have a couple rapid-fire questions, and we'll move to audience Q&A. Um, I read a great blog post from you two, three, four months ago. Some of you have probably read it. Most of you have probably not. Um, talking about how, as you were putting Spur together, you had looked at and talked to founders in all the major startup hubs everybody hears about, you know, the Valley and Austin and New York and all those sorts of places. But you decided that the right move was to start Spur here um, for some re reasons that when I read it seemed they weren't things I would have realized, you know, and then after I read it, I was like, oh, that makes total sense. Could, could you kind of talk about that some for our audience who maybe hasn't, haven't read that, that post you made? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think a lot of times, especially in the tech world, you feel like you need to be in Silicon Valley. I mean, I know I feel out of the loop of sort of the information flow a little bit, um, or New York or Boston or, or whatever. Um, but every market has its challenges. And when, so when I had the opportunity to um, start traveling more and talking to more founders and, and people who've built really successful businesses um, in sort of the, the, the name brand markets, um, I was so surprised by how much they lamented being in San Francisco or being in New York and how hard it was to find talent and how competitive it was, especially for technical talent. Um, and so, you know, we've been really, really fortunate in our business to have just an incredible product and engineering team. We have, I, I, would, I would say our team is, you know, uh, on par with the best Silicon Valley startup in terms of technical talent. Um, and Huntsville is one of those, in fact, Huntsville, you know, interestingly enough, is very similar to what Silicon Valley was before it was Silicon Valley. Um, you know, there was a huge NASA and defense you know, industry there. Um, and so that, that's, that's sort of why, that's what Silicon Valley grew out of, is because they had that base of technical talent. And Huntsville has that. I mean, we have a lot of technical talent because of our, our roots and, and space and missile defense and, and defense generally. So there's a lot of great talent here. And we found this to be a market where we could be much more competitive for that talent because, you know, I think a lot of people go and work on the arsenal or go and work, you know, at NASA, no offense to anybody that works there, and, and imagine they're gonna build spaceships and, you know, and then it doesn't quite end up that way. And the culture that they're looking for isn't quite what they thought it might be. And so 
that gives us an opportunity to kind of stand out and say, hey, like, we'll all go get beer at four o'clock. Like, you know, we have a very open sort of more modern work style, and, you know, unlimited time off and all these sort of things that make us attractive um, to that talent. And so I found Huntsville to be a market where we could be really, really competitive for the talent that we needed in order to solve some of the problems we were trying to solve. So what I found to be a challenge, and still find to be a challenge, is on the non-technical talent. And so, you know, a business is not, a tech, like a, a technology company is not simply about building software, right? You have to get users, and you have to, you have a sales and marketing function, and you have a customer success and customer support function, and you want really smart people to help lead those efforts and design that, and that's been a challenge for us. And so. You know, even now we're considering whether or not we need to open you know, a second office somewhere else to help attract some of that talent, um, or whether or not we'll be able to actually attract that to Huntsville, yet to be seen. So, so let's, let's dig into that just a little bit. Um, we've got a pretty good slice of the community here. You know, uh, we've got a lot of young people, I think, that are very ambitious, and it's kind of self-selected sample, right, uh, of folks that I think will be leaders in the community for years to come. Um, so I think this is a good forum to hear hear your your opinion. You know, how, how do you think we develop that non-technical talent to be able to build, you know, startups and more, uh, you know, exciting businesses? I mean, the obvious is like you know, Austin, you have like a Dell takeoff, right? And you just you sort of have all this talent there. But you know, what's what's sort of your opinion or your advice? To, I know there's not one magic bullet, but uh, you know, for the community as a whole. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's not one magic bullet. Um, I think there's a lot of things. Unfortunately, and this is probably like a really self-serving comment, um, and I don't mean it that way, but but I do think you have to have a couple of really big wins. Um, be, not because of anything other than that gives an opportunity for other people to learn the skills necessary to go out and start their own companies. And that's how, you, you know, in most communities where you have a really vibrant startup, ecosystem, you've seen something like in Austin where you have a couple of, of companies that really thrive and people that come up through the ranks in those companies that are part of that ride and learn, you know, end up going out and becoming CTOs somewhere else or founders of new businesses or, you know, they, they help figure out how to do, how to build an, an inbound marketing program and so now they go out and do it somewhere else. And so, you know, success breeds success. So I think that's one thing that we will have to have companies, whether it's the Spurs of the world, the Curses, the Daily Burns, those types of companies that come here, that start here, and then that can have some level of success to, to sort of seed that talent pool. But then I think also like we have to do a better job, and I don't think we do a great job of it right now, of really promoting those successes. And I totally agree. That's something we talk about in Urban, urban Engine all the time. I think most folks are not aware there's you know, $50 million a year company like Appleton uh, here in Huntsville, right? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, I think we do a really good job attracting space and defense and manufacturing um, to Huntsville, and, and it's understandable why. I mean, it's a great, great boost to our economy, and it's what we know how to do. But if we want to become a startup, sort of technology-driven community, and develop other, other industries here, like, it, we've got to start doing a better job you know, telling that story of why is this a place you want to come. Yeah, you know, there's also, you know, I, I found that the um, imp, the ability to to raise capital is going to be really important in the startup community. Um, and there are a lot more investors who are really open to the idea of investing outside of Silicon Valley or New York or Boston or, or Chicago. Um, in fact, you know, there, there are funds that specifically target like Revolution Capital, for instance, uh, Steve Case, who's one of the founders of uh, AOL, I mean, his entire fund's sort of theme is rise of the rest, investing in all the other sort of middle, middle America companies. And they do this tour around the country, stopping in different sort of cities like Huntsville. And, you know, why we didn't reach out to them and say, come to Huntsville and, you know, make this part of your big tour that's going to get all this press, like, I think those are missed opportunities that can not only bring attention to Huntsville and help get positive PR, um, but also help founders of businesses feel like this is a community where I don't I don't have to go somewhere else if I want to raise money or start a business. Like this is a community where people recognize it as a good place to do business. 
Um, and so we've got to start doing more of those things. Uh, so a couple rapid fire questions here. I think that was a fantastic response. Thank you for uh, uh, getting that, that that detail with us. That's something we should talk about more offline as well uh, with the Urban Engine team. Um, for folks who kind of want to know more about how you think about the world and information you think is useful, do you have any favorite books or you know even podcasts, other media uh, for folks that are interested in this kind of stuff to, to dig deeper? Um, yeah, I mean, I think Masters of Scale is a great podcast. Reed Hoffman, um, founder of LinkedIn, uh, does a great, um, great podcast about you know, scaling businesses and starting, you know, starting uh, mainly technology-driven startups and how you how you scale those. And, um, Zero to One um, is is a great book, um, especially if you're just getting ready to found or start something. Um, is it, that, that book will make you ready to run through a wall somewhere. Yeah, yeah it will, and it'll make you again second guess a lot of your sort of preconceived ideas, and so which is good. Um, you know, for us, like I said, we, we've been doing a book study internally on, on principles by Ray Dalio, which you mentioned earlier. Which um, I think, you know, as you as you grow, that's a really interesting way to think about managing um, a team of creative, you know, highly intelligent people. Um, which is you, know, you find in technology companies, um, you know, his idea of idea meritocracy that he talks about, I found to be really interesting. Um, so yeah, those are those are a couple. Of uh, you're obviously extremely busy now. You're trying to fundraise. You got two companies. I'm sure uh, time is very much a bottleneck for you at this point. How do you do? You have any system or, or favorite sort of productivity schedule management uh, advice for for everyone? Well, I have a great assistant. Nicole, um, who's hiding in the back, um, she she helps me stay on top of everything. Um, I um, really attach to my Google Calendar, and um, I use Inbox, which is a, a different user interface for Gmail. Um, it's very helpful if you you know if you're like me and you send yourself emails to remind you to do something. You know, it's sort of designed without you having to send an email. You can just put a reminder, and then it's right there in your inbox. And um, so that that's a very productive tool for me. Um, but yeah, I mean, no no special secrets other than you know being really protective over my calendar and, and really trying to stick to that. Uh, so final question: Say you can blast out one short, simple piece of advice to every entrepreneur in the world. Uh, what would that be? What's Glenn Clayton's advice? Yeah, no pressure on that. Um, you know, I, I think something that was a little bit surprising to me is I think a lot of times as, as an entrepreneur, you think your job is to have all the answers, is to, to be like the technical genius or to be the um, operational genius or the sales and marketing genius or whatever um, to solve all the problems. But what I found and, and the mistakes that I've made along the way and then the successes that we've had, uh, whatever ones they've been, I think has, has been recognizing that my job was really more about communication than anything else. It was about you know, being good with people and being able to communicate what sort of the why is to those people. And so um, as we've been successful over the last several years, you know, the thing that, that I think that I've gotten better at that's helped you know, that success happen um, is being able to find people who are smarter than me, communicate to them about why I think we should go run through this wall over here, convincing them that we should go run through the wall. Um, and then as we run through the wall, as a team, getting really good at convincing other people to follow behind us. And, um, and so all of that requires like communication, whether it's convincing the, the right people, the people that you feel are smarter than you and you can't believe they want to work with you, convincing them to join your team, convincing those people who are inevitably going to be very opinionated and have their own ideas to all get in sync and row in the same direction, um, or whether it's convincing customers or users to adopt your product. Um, it's it's all comes back to communication. and. I'd say the first half of my career, I did not think that was what my primary responsibility was. And the last half, I feel like that's, that is my primary responsibility. That's awesome. 
Oh, Lynn, I think that's the perfect place to end the structured part of the interview. Um, and I'd like to turn it over to the audience now, I'm sure. Missed tons of areas, lots of great questions you guys have. Who, who wants to kick us off? Is everybody shy? Hey. Tim Ben? <laughs> yes, ma'am. All right. So, oh. That's not good. <laughs> So I heard you say Nashville. What other markets are you looking at to launch Spur? So um, as we merge Appleton and Spur into one business, you know our footprint um, right now uh, with Appleton uh, is primarily in the southeast. Um, so you know Huntsville, Birmingham, Montgomery, um, getting into Florida and Georgia a little bit. Um, <clears throat> where our primary sort of focus is uh, in education staffing and being able to bring on new new clients there. Um, Florida, Georgia, uh, Virginia, um, Pennsylvania are all markets that, that are pretty high up on our priority list. Um, and for us, you know, we think what we do can be effective anywhere, right? Anywhere where there's enough density of jobs to where a staffing company could exist today, well, we want to go there. So the, the real decision set for us is not where do people want what we have, it's where can we be effective in our go-to-market strategy. And that being, where can we go in, effectively uh, appeal to school districts in that market to help us seed our marketplace with workers and jobs, and then start to build the commercial business around that. And so um, our primary focus is in markets where we feel like we can be really effective within education to begin with. Um, and so it's a variety, primarily metro markets. Um, everywhere that we're targeting is, you know, a, a secondary or, or, or primary market. So. But I'm curious about uh, where you see Spur going. Do you think right now you're working kind of on the gig economy? Do you think there's potential for you to eventually disrupt kind of the typical nine to five jobs that many of us find ourselves in? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question about what, what sort of our long-term aspiration. So, if, I have a real problem about wanting to jump right to the end, like I want to go from A to Z, and so I've got a lot of great smart people around me who remind me like we probably need to go to B first. Um, but, you know, I, I have a vision of, of the labor market really changing uh, quite a bit. Um, the labor market is probably a lot, is the largest market um, on the planet, and it's the most disaggregated of all, right? So the idea that we still all go and go through an interview, which has been proven to be a very ineffective, low bandwidth way of, of communicating qualifications, um, the fact that, you know, there are, if you look at you know, the BLS statistics, Bureau of Labor Statistics, the unemployment rate and the job vacancy rate in almost every industry is equal. Which makes no sense, right? Like, I mean, if you say the unemployment rate's 5% and 5% of the jobs in this industry are vacant, well, like, clearly there's just a mismatching. There's not like there's not enough people. You're just not doing a really good job getting the right people in the right places. Um, and so the industry is very inefficient. It's very disaggregated. I think we're at a time where, you know, thanks to smartphones and the proliferation of those devices to the point where now even the lowest income brackets have over 80% smartphone adoption. Um, we're finally getting to a point where we can start to leverage that device and that access to data to not only make it easier for people to find work, but start to capture a lot more data about them when they're working. And so our long-term aspirations are very much centered around data and smart use of data, not only to help someone who wants to go work a catering job, but long term to say, where does this person want to be working in 10 years? And I think that model can apply to any type of work, whether it's your hourly shift work, which is where we're starting at, because that's sort of the lowest barrier of entry, or the most highly skilled work. Um, right now, when we work, we, you know, we go on LinkedIn. I don't know about you guys, but I get people every day that endorse me on LinkedIn that I don't know. And I'm like, I don't know how to do that thing. I don't know why you're endorsing me for it. Um, and so that and resumes and like interviews are the ways that people find jobs today and like connect with jobs. And it's just not very effective. And 
by creating a platform where people can directly connect with jobs through our platform, work the job, we start to capture a lot of data around, hey, does this guy show up five minutes early or five minutes late to his job? Because he clocks in on our device, we know that. What are the ratings that this place is giving him? Um, what are we hearing about him from other workers who've worked with that person? Um, that makes it much more uh, easy for us to then say, here's another job you might be interested in. You're lacking one credential to qualify for that job. We can help you get that. It'll increase your income 40%. And we can go convince that person that you'll be really good at it because we have all this work history and all these reviews and ratings of your, of your work history to give them a lot of reason to take a chance on you. Um, and I think that will translate across job categories. Thanks. Anybody else? Is the, is the heat sapping you guys will to live out there? Last one? Okay. Here, here. Hmm. Nick? Sure. This is our board chair of Urban Engine. So Glenn, you pivoted your business several times. Yeah. Talk about that and how were, how were those decisions made? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I feel like I'm really good at pivoting businesses at this point. That's uh, it's good at making mistakes. Um, no, I mean, I think, like I said earlier, you know, the one thing that, that has defined my time as an entrepreneur and I think now really defines the culture of our company is aggressively sort of seeking out the truth. And sometimes the truth isn't what you want it to be, right? Like, I mean, um, you know, started a tutoring company um, because that's what I knew how to do. Um, built that and then franchised that and did not know how to do that. Um, and was failing at that and then said, well, what else you know, could this do and had an opportunity come my way. So I executed on that and I, I think for me, the thing I, I feel like I've been really able to develop my personal skill set as um, is sort of solving problems. Like I'm just, I feel like I'm constantly maybe creating my own problems and then having to solve them. But um, my skill set is, is, I think, largely around I enjoy problem solving. Um, and you know, now I've been fortunate to get to the point where with Spur, with what we're doing, with the mission that we have, where I feel like that's a problem that's worth solving, that like, I feel like will actually make the world a better place if we're successful. Um, and so, you know, I've kind of found, finally found that perfect uh, mix of what's the need, um, what, are, what are my skill sets and my team's skill sets, uh, and do they intersect that? And for me personally, is this something that I feel good about, that I feel passionate will make the world a better place? And so um, i pivoted at different times for different reasons, but um, what we're doing now with Spur is really, for me, the first time where all three of those things kind of intersect. You know, need, ability, and passion. So. Well, I think that's a, a super inspirational way to, uh, to, to end this tonight. Thank you guys, to all of you, for, for coming out tonight. Uh, for those of you that are here for uh, co-working night workshops those those will be starting uh, shortly um, so be sure to check those out if, if you haven't been before go check out the workshops or just hang around and mingle if that's more your thing uh, I've got a lot of smart people here in the room a lot of folks you ought to connect with and get to know uh, Tony are you still around do you want to uh, if you want to say anything before we go the shirts are still out front if you want one. <laughs> Go buy a shirt. Everybody give Glenn a hand, please.